Okay. Catherine, hello. Welcome. Hi. Thanks Good for afternoon. Having me. Hi, everybody. Uh, Daniel back again for an episode on the show. So this is, Catherine, a hybrid between something we call study groups on psychoanalysis and politics and a podcast they started, which has some relevance to the topic we're going to discuss today, because I started a podcast with a bunch of people interested in theory after mm -hmm. reading Anti-Oedipus. And um, actually, it has a funny backstory because it's in D.C. that it happened. And we met on Twitter and we met in person to talk about the book by Deleuze and Guattari at um, Comet Ping Pong, which was the site of the infamous Pizzagate. Oh, my God. Wow. OK. It's a very interesting connection because there's that whole controversy of like Deleuze and his connection to... Um, the pedophilia laws and things of this nature. And then we were, but we were there before the Pizzagate fiasco, just because a lot of people that like serve drinks at that restaurant are our friends. And some of them were part of the reading group. Anyways. Okay. okay. Let me okay. turn my, turn off my phone. Okay. All right. Well, um, Catherine Liu is coming at us from Irvine, California, where she professes film and theory media uh, film and media studies yeah media mm -hmm. studies okay mm -hmm. and this conversation is going to consider um where the very <laughs> very i think lesser known history and I, I do want to start off with the history if we could of the really surprising and frankly overwhelming influence that french theory had on intellectual life in America, broadly speaking, right? And um, I say it's surprising in part because right now that influence has kind of waned, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But certainly if you were going to college in the 80s and the 90s, it was much more prominent. And um, one of the books that we should reference here is Francois Cousset's interesting book on French theory in America, which I was just finishing actually reading mm -hmm. um, on your recommendation actually Catherine I really enjoyed the book mm -hmm. um, and of course Catherine is known to us as the author of a um, very polemical text on the PMC the professional managerial managerial class called virtue hoarders which is by now well known to us and Catherine has kind of shaped contemporary discourse on the left um, after following this intervention. And I remember, Catherine, listening to an interview you did on Jacobin, mm -hmm. where you were very critical of, I think it was Deleuzean theory, yeah. and the kind of the rhizomes. and Post-structuralism, yeah, yeah. Post-structuralism, yeah. yeah. Right, right, so writ large. That, yep. that caught my ear, because I share your commitment to broad-based socialist politics, although we can discuss how you fall on that. Um but maybe where this would turn into a comradely debate would be about where the function and the role, the centrality of theory might reside on the socialist left. But okay. before, before we get to that, before we get to that, can you, if it's okay, give us the historical, maybe origin and breakdown of a little bit of the history of why French theory became such a big deal in American academia? Okay, um, you know, I'm going to get um, in the nitty gritty. It really was one event. In 1967, um, a bunch of professors at Hopkins organized a conference called the Structuralist Controversy. And um, Richard Maxey, who was the head of the Humanities Center there, invited for the first time to the U.S., Roland Barthes, Jacques Lacan, and at Derrida, mm -hmm. and there were also American um, interlocutors at that conference, and it sort of, you know, caught everyone um, by surprise. Sixty-seven, as you can imagine, is an incredibly um, politically charged moment in the university. Hopkins, I would say, is fairly conservative with regard to campus unrest, but there is this um, Lacan, you know, gives his kind of crazy um, sort of prophetic um, speech. So, to, so um, 
um, Bart also talks about, um, you know, the semiotic theoretical tradition. And it's really the first time that in the, um, on, the, on American soil, we hear a group of French scholars talking, theorists talking this way. And so um, I think Foucault comes in afterwards and then um, people on the left in the United States really take on this theory, many of them in the humanities. And um, I'm gonna say that there are really um, three conditions for why it becomes so popular in the 70s, 67, um, we have the structuralist controversy. By 68, 69 in the United States, the left is already falling apart. Um, there's this like crazy sense that um, the counterculture is already running um, low on steam. It's become like just transgressive and increasingly depoliticized. Um, 68, um, Richard Nixon is elected at president and then um, he runs again and he's re-elected in 72. There's an incredible political disappointment on the left. Like why wasn't, why wasn't the dream of the counterculture realized in politics? And in many ways, this was a moment when the left reassessment, especially among intellectuals who were disaffected or academics or disaffected who were the growing class of the professional managerial class. The, you know, they were all, they were in graduate school. Most of them were male, most of them were white. They got very, they embraced this theory, especially with Lacan on the question of fantasy. And secondly, um, with semiotics and Voxian semiotics, especially because there is this looking at ideology with regard to, um, Decoding interpretation play becomes really important. Derrida works on Derrida's um, talk in 67 is actually about play, structure, sign, and play. And the playfulness that the counterculture wanted to create as a kind of new politics, as kind of ludic politics of um, the libido, say, gets you know slammed in the face in France and the United States by the election of right-wing politicians, including de Gaulle in France, Nixon in the United States. So you have all this like cultural, political energy, and it all goes into theory. Because in many ways, Lacan welcomed the, dis the disaffected 68ers into his seminars, many of whom decided to go into analysis with him because they realized there were more issues with um, um, their politics, let's say, which were not popular, mm -hmm. at least in popular democracy, right? So... That's like a very, very long um, idea. But there, there is another way of interpreting this, mm -hmm. which is that um, a lot of American um, male, mostly male um, academics or aspiring graduate students in 68 and into the 70s were part of this boomer generation of upstarts and REVs who didn't have the cultural capital of like the, the deadly, boring, um, humanist professors, the Tweedy guys who, you know, declaimed war Wordsworth or whatever of the 50s and 60s who came from like snobby families on the East Coast. There was a new social group that had entered academia at the time um, whose parents might have been part of the GI Bill, who were part of that boomer generation, um, who enjoyed a lot of upward mobility and optimism. And because they didn't have the social capital of, um, of the previous and the cultural capital of previous generations, they looked to someone like Derrida, someone like Bach, someone even like Lacan, who was kind of out, they were outsiders too within French academia. Mm. Mm. And what these post structuralists and theorists gave people permission to do was talk about the humanities, talk about literature without having read every goddamn book in the library, right. without having come from a family with a lot of books, right? right. So right. this was incredibly liberating. So if you couldn't find the actualization of liberation and mass emancipation in the political sphere, you could find it in the textual sphere. Right. Right. So um, I feel like nobody wants to hear this in theory because it's too historical, you know, there were all these debates going on when I was young in graduate school, the theory versus history wars. Basically, the historicists like Stephen Greenblatt were like, 
anti-theory and then you have like the extreme anti-historical people who are high you know heideggerians you know fighting it out well you know what the kind of history that people were doing was not marxist history it was not historical materialism and the kinds of um theory that were coming out of france i'd say were actually somewhat were actually anti-communist, anti-left. Mm-hmm. Because the Communist Party was in France very powerful. So in France right. you have this situation where I'm sorry if I'm going on and on, but I actually no, know good. a lot about this stuff. So I'm just going to be super Wait. pedantic. Um the Communist Party was one of the last Europe the French Communist Party was one of the last European communist parties to give up on Stalin, right? And you have incredible scholars in France like Lucien Goldman who studied the 17th and 18th centuries. You, you know, the Ancien Régime, uh, close to what I studied, I got my PhD in. And they just didn't repudiate Stalin for a really long time. So you have this younger group of people coming up in the 60s and 70s, and they were looking at the left like, you guys are just so fucked up, you're totalitarians, right? Foucault being among them. Now, if you want to say that it's really sinister, you can say that certain kinds of... Um, CIA cultural fronts probably supported that kind of anti-communist, anti-materialist discourse. And um, it became very popular in the United States as well because deconstruction actually fit really well with um, new criticism. Mm. And new criticism also allowed, um, homegrown new criticism, Mm. allowed American scholars, and this was definitely for the GI Bill, to say and new criticism came out of the south was you know totally reactionary but very very like formalistic and rigorous and they would just say you focus on the text right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. don't look at the history don't look at the cultural history don't look at the economic history because the literary text has all the truths that you need and if you want to look at economics history or politics then you're being a determinist you're being a stalinist well, the other thing about the focus on the text was, as I said before, for people who did not come from families with a lot of cultural background, like mine, I mean, I think we had Reader's Digest books in my house. You could say, wow, I, all I have to do is do a really close reading of Rousseau. I don't have to know anything about the 18th century and how crazy the 18th century was because it's totally overwhelming the amount of and from the amount of literature, secondary literature that's out there. I can just do a close reading of this one paragraph and derive some meaning from it. This is what the new critics did with poetry, right? And this is what Derrida did with philosophy and sort of um, political philosophy, et cetera. But the one thing that you will find, like a red thread going through a lot of these um, theorists, including Deleuze and Guattari, is, um, and Deleuze and Guattari uh, were actually anti-Freudian too, was a kind of anti-Marxism, kind of skepticism about the old Marxist traditions. Um, So, okay, that's my long answer. All right. All right. That's, 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 that's helpful. I mean, (laughs) Lucien Goldman was at that 66 conference. I think you, I think you knew that, but he, he was marginalized. And I, I personally, I actually forgot that. Yeah, no, I personally feel that his marginalization has been uh, mostly coming from the Althusserians has been very unfortunate um, because they have a problem with the way that he incorporates sociology and history into the study of Marxism. And I literature, look, he was literate. He was. Literate. Yeah. Yeah. That too. Yeah. I mean, his, his book on Pascal is the hidden God is a tremendous way of, of doing historic historical Marxist historicism. Um, look, I, I think that your, 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 um, historical pinpoint of the 66 moment is helpful. What's what I think people don't maybe recognize is actually, and again, you see this in Francois Cousset's book on the influence of French theory is that in fact, French theory changed the way that we read the way that we approach intellectual texts. Right. And that actually interests me more from a kind of cultural influence standpoint, putting aside the question of whether French theory has been problematic to the left, putting that question to the side. Okay. Um, like, like, you know what I mean? Like it changed the culture of how universities relate to the funk, to the figure of the intellectual. I mean, there was a time 
in which every university was hungry and, and had to have one of the big French guys mm. at their department. That's That doesn't happen anymore. But even in Irvine, where you are, I think that was Derrida's stomping grounds. Was or was that Le yeah. Leo Tar? No, both. Both of them. So there's... So what do you mean by difference in reading? Because I'm going to go hard sociological again. So before I go socio hard sociological, tell me what you mean by it's changed the way. I mean, sense. and I mean the way that French theory informed and changed the way that we look at literary canon formation for starters, like that actually had a big influence there which we can kind of talk like about. destroying and that, the canon. Okay, well, yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, it's it's complex, and I think it's much different now than it was. But where the politics of the canon are, um, are owed to this kind of very interesting history of French theory. And I think the other important thing that maybe you didn't note is that if you take a figure like Derrida, Derrida rose largely off of the backs of um Spivak, quite literally. Um, that's she, totally not true. Well, she this rose is, on this his was Kuste's argument where she he okay. says, just let me finish. He says uh her introduction to of grammatology oh, right. was like so you know okay, she, I got it. I got it. She yeah. centered Derrida in, in ways she was one of the first real celebrators, you could say yeah. champions. And yeah. in the in the American Academy specifically, yes, because yes, Derrida yes. was always an outsider. He was always a guest, a very masterly, you know, figure. But he was a guest. And then the other thing you didn't note is the way in which, pretty quickly, French theory got connected to um, the question of minorities within acad academia, and and the whole. And can can you talk a little bit about that, like? Um, what do you mean? Like post-colonial theory post and things like that? Colonial, but also maybe even the sociology of non-white academia, like the okay. non-whitening of academia and its connection to French theory, which... Oh, you mean you mean like French theory diversified academia on the level of the ethnic um, academic? Okay. Is that what you mean? Because I mean, I'm going to talk mean about that, this I mean in a different that, I mean way. That, I mean that ethnic... Um, ethnic studies and, came out of deconstruction? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that French theory was used politically for gender for for broadly speaking identitarian ends struggles etc. We can assess the legacy of that, but I think it's important to throw that onto the table. Is all I'm saying, and I was going to invite you to say a little bit more about that. Edward okay. Said, Edward Said with Foucault, Spivak herself, um, Judith you know, Butler with gender matters. Judith Butler, gender like yeah. Matters. So talk talk a little bit about that, about the function and the role of, because the interesting thing about it, Catherine, is that at the heart of it, it was actually a kind of post identity thing. It was not an affirmation of identity politics as we understand it in a vulgar sense. In reality, the core of French theory was trying to complicate identity, right? Um, in in maybe arguably quite interesting ways. But I I know that you've think a lot okay. about that so go ahead well okay so um maybe american identitarianism relies on pluralism and french identity french theory as the french um as you might want to interpret it relied on difference so both are anti-universalist into anti-totalizing so in that sense they converge um intellectually but the thing that I wanted to talk about was the introduction of the celebrity system into the humanities. Yep. And all of these people that you're talking about, including Spivak, were brought in to, um, well, not were brought in, but, you know, um, at a time when you're still building, when you're building an institution like Irvine, which was nothing, you know, just pastures and ranch in 71, one of the easiest ways to create, um, to make a mark was to have stars come in yeah. and Hillis Miller left Yale. He was friends with Damon and Derrida. And then he brought Derrida to come to Irvine. And there was a lot of um, support for him because Irvine was a very, very young campus at the time. And um, they were willing to throw a lot of resources to, at the humanities to create an immediate impact because there was, um, there was um, sort of name recognition mm. and Derrida had been at Yale. 
and Hillis Miller had been at Yale. So they literally said they wanted to make Irvine Paris on the, on the Pacific, which is, which has this fantasy that, you know, California is a tabula rasa that you can build this kind of cosmopolitan um, city in the, uh, on the um, Pacific. Today, Irvine is dominated by biological sciences. It is, it wants to be a pre-med school. The humanities are increasingly um, marginalized with regard to its projects. So that project of institution building via celebrities, because when you were saying each institution was hungry to have these stars visit, yes, that's exactly how it operated. So in terms of a history of the counterculture, you have a way in which um, all of that transgressive cultural energy becomes um, sort of celebrity energy by the 70s. And I remember when Jameson went to Duke, it was like a huge coup for Duke because he was a big star, you know, and the and fights between one Spivak- I note on that, did you know, you know, the whole thing there was Stanley Fish brought him there, right? Right, right. Fish and Stanley was Fish was a very enig- enigmatic figure, enigmatic politically, because he was a bit like Richard Rorty. Like we look at Rorty or Fish now hmm, in 2022, and we see their liberal, like at the core, they're undeniably an anti-Marxist liberal. But at the time, somehow they were able to kind of, you know, have this great grand dialogue with French, like all of this, all of these different, it's almost as if the principles of the politics didn't matter in that context. No, it never mattered because it was about institution building, and um, they these people were at a great um, at a great junction when they had the ear of the administration, and um, you know Fish was also a dean in various places, and he, they were you know hardline liberals who wanted to have you know um, impact institutionally, yep. so they were very pragmatic too. They you know Worthy is a pragmatist, so. Um, when you say that the French that French theory was anti-identitarian and then it became used for identity politics, I would just say that it's anti both systems of thinking are anti-universalist. And so in a way, you can you can see how logically Judith Butler's gender matters coming out of deconstruction becomes like um the legacy of deconstruction with regard to performativity. And Derrida did a lot of stuff on that. So, you know, when you think about like where theory is now, it's not in a good place, but, um, and institutionally it's really battered, but gender theory has been really, really powerful. And the other um, branch of sort of French theory as it's been, you know, um, siphoned through American, American academia is trauma theory and trauma studies, also yeah. incredibly powerful. So those are like the twin legacies and, I'm not sure that um, I would rec- I would you know endorse either of these positions, but that's the position. That's where um, like the things that we think of as French theory have really left their mark and continue right. to leave their mark. So I I'm not like I my um, position on all of this is more that we should have an open mindedness to understanding their historical um, context. It meant a great deal to me when I was younger. I feel like I was miseducated um, because of the charisma of this. And in many ways, I'm doing my penance by insisting on history. The one thing that I will say, because this is a more theory-oriented, psychoanalytically-oriented stream that I don't really say on the Lefty podcast is the, the professional managerial class theory that I developed really has as its basis this idea that... Um, credentialed elites have set up or try to set up a social superego. And their um, their hatred of the working classes still devolves into a kind of working class is um, uncivilized id, and we have the superego. But the superego, as we know, is deeply connected to the id, and it's a vicious, sadistic superego. It's an, mm-hmm. and, it's, uh, and it tries to impose itself as a universal ego ideal that but it actually masks the 
professional managerial classes, economic and material interests. Mm. So, um, so that's something that I'll yeah. explore at another time. I'm also writing a book on trauma studies yeah. and it is about, you know, very much um, the social cultural brew of, you know, the end of the cold war and the rise of this vulnerable, what I call the suffering citizen, as opposed to the reasoning citizen. Mm. Um, because there was all that stuff about, you know, post-structuralism being very skeptical about reason and universal reason. And, um, one of the things that I think that is really important about the structural changes in um, financialized capitalism and neoliberalism is that um, French theory actually provides an incredible rationale for um, the kinds of social inequality and economic inequality and sort of social quiet political quietism that the PMC would really like to um, secure for itself. I can yeah. unpack that later, but yeah, you know, no, I'll that's a lot. That no, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're having this because I, I can tell that it animates you and um, you have a, <laughs> it triggers a lot, not to use it, to, <laughs> but, but it, it does, it does bring out a lot for you. And it brings out a lot for me too. I mean, I was turned to the life of the mind by reading this stuff. This is very, you know, important to me. And I, and I think Catherine, I think it's important, especially for people that follow my channel and, you know, even the stuff that I write, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced of Lacan's, um, orientation in a lot of ways, although I deviate from it in different ways. Have you ever um, been analyzed? I have. Yeah. I've gone, I've undergone analysis. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So look, psychoanalysis is important to me for a myriad of reasons, which we don't need to get into, but let's just, let's just say, let's just, let's just, let's just halt it at a, at a precise point. Really important to me as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And we can talk about, because I think the 66 moment of the structuralist conference in Baltimore, I walk by the building when I visit Baltimore, I'm, I live close by and I'm always haunted by it. I do agree with you that the kind of, that moment steered it also it really did undermine marxism within the academy now i think at the same time there are outliers within this thing called french theory because we have to remember that and Cousset shows this in france there is no french theory like this this is an american invention it was mm -hmm. created as a very specific american thing and the important thing to note is that the function, the place of the university within this country is one that is cut off from civil society, yet at the same time has this kind of paradoxical power over creating the discourse. And one of the ways that it does that is that it kind of selects very specific issues and raises them to attention. And Cousset shows that um, French theory and its popularity was part of the reason why you had the canon wars in the 90s, which which started a huge conflagration with the neoconservative movement. Mm -hmm. And in part is part of the reason why French theory probably died out, right? So it became weaponized by, frankly, reactionary conservative academics and intellectuals, um, even though many of those conservative and reactionaries had some affinity to French theory themselves, like Fish. Um, so it's a complicated history. And I also think it's complicated because many of those philosophers or thinkers taken by themselves, like take, take Deleuze, you probably know, but he wrote a later work on the control societies where he did, he did turn to Marx. He did turn back to Marxism, right? It's like a very, it's like a 12 page article and anti-Oedipus is like a 800 page book. But yeah, and, everyone and, goes. Hold, everyone hold goes to um, um, control societies. Great, great essay. We, Does it really help us understand the digital world that we're living in? Maybe. I think that I think Byung Chul Han's advancement in Deleuze's control societies, in his notion of the performance society, probably gives us better indications of a shift in contemporary culture, in my view. But let's let's address anti Oedipus. Anti Oedipus is a Marxist work. It's not an anti Marxist work. I think number one. I think number two, we have to recognize that not only in France, but across the board, 
Marxist theory, you can call it post-Marxism, whatever you want, had and was undergoing major changes. Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe in their hegemony theory, like, like, okay, no, hold, hold on a second. Now you, we can, we can criticize all of those as revisionist and and unorthodox and and wild and kind of reformist. No, no, no. I would say anti-Marxist, not not for, not revisionist, not anything. But you know, go on. Okay, just okay. But what, uh, what, what, what I'm trying to say, my disagreement. What, I, totally what, what, disagree. what I'm trying to say is, I'm generally my concern with your line of argumentation, which I have much sympathy with, Catherine. Is I want to know this stuff, this French theory, these these philosophers produce some extremely titillating and interesting. And you were hooked on it. I was hooked on it. I was never hooked on Deleuze. Never. Okay. Okay. Well, in general. Yeah. And as such, I think as an exercise in thinking, it actually has something to offer us. I really do. And I think that we run the risk of a kind of of a kind of anti-intellectualism if we are not careful with how we criticize it. I have a whole chapter in my book on the family that's called literally a critique of Deleuze and Guattari. I'm all for criticizing them, but I'm all for also reading them carefully and for taking them seriously, because I think one of the outcomes of this line of argumentation could be that maybe somebody who's coming to this stuff fresh might say, well, it, it's not worth reading. And my, my pushback would be, it is worth reading, but it's also worth historically situating it in, in the way that it has unfolded. What do you think of that? Do you agree that we need to wrestle with this stuff? Or do you think it's better that we just kind of move on from it? Which stuff? Okay, if we're talking about anti-Oedipus and a thousand plateaus, Jill's by himself, Proust and Signs, incredible book. Um, for me, and I'd like to hear what you think, like name me one insight, in anti-Oedipus that's really powerful and Marxist that is worth preserving. I pers I don't want to push anyone away from it. I'm not like an authoritarian that way. If you want to read that stuff, fine. I have nothing to say about it. I'm not an anti-intellectual by any means, but my I just tell students to come to me. There are fewer of them now, but if they want to come and read the list, I say, I'm just too dumb to read that. Um, I can help you with Frankfurt School. I'll help you with Marxism. I'll help you with literature. I'll help you with Bakhtin. I'll help you with um, um, film theory, um, genre theory. I'll do you know class analysis. There's so many other really exciting things that are happening intellectually on my bookshelves. And if you really want to go do a deep dive into Liz, you know there are a lot of people in academia who can help you, and it's not going to be me. And that, and I feel like I have the freedom to say that. I have the freedom to dismiss it because mm. I'm not going to mm. read the. I cannot literally read that book. I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah. And one of the things is <laughs> for me now is how does it add to the general intellect? How one of the things about American academia, America, and capitalism is we have no historical sensibility, and the historical materialism that I try to imbue with my students is to look at the history of higher education, look at the history of theory, look at the metropolis, the growth of film, the growth of film culture in the metropolis, mm -hmm. to look at the division of labor, look at the evolution of capitalism, look at the ways in which uh, the online world has mm -hmm. been capitalized on. And you know what is an 800 page book I would rather read? Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism. Mm. Read postscript to um, uh, control societies. Right. Very good. But do not think that that is the be all and end all because what Zuboff does in her 800 page book is show how Sergey Brin and those guys at Google had a communalist, communard idea of what Google was and how in 2003, 2004, when they were not making any money, they started, you know, don't remember, don't be evil. They gave up on Don't Be Evil, and they started to use Google Search as a surveillance bot to mm. keep to make their platforms profitable, mm. to and to make surveillance the order of the day, and to mm. produce masses of data that mm. they could sell to advertisers. Right. So there are so many things. 
that we need to understand about the infrastructure of surveillance capitalism, postscript to control societies, fantastic. It's of a moment, but it's not really prophetic. Just as Benjamin's 19, cap, Paris capital of the 19th century can give us inspiration to understand why New York became capital of the 20th century, maybe Shanghai is capital of the 21st century, mm. why we can understand urbanization and labor and leisure as critical masses that create urban agglomerations where capitalism um, both exploits and stimulates um, masses of the working class. From those perspectives, great. Read Benjamin, then understand the development of financial capitalism and urban geography mm -hmm. as Mike Davis does. Yeah. If you want to read Postscript to Control Societies and that leads you to Zuboff, mm -hmm. that's great. But don't not read Zuboff. Don't think just because you're, there are fewer people like this in academia now, but they're not reading Zuboff still. They're, she comes out of Harvard Business School. Um, people think that, you know, it's too um, empirical in some ways, but I cannot tell you how important that book is. And it came out two years ago. It's a very fat book. So part of the thing about French theory is you can go down this rabbit hole, but make sure you lift your head up and say, you know, how does this help me understand the actuality of, um, you know, um, capitalism today? And that's yeah. one, and, and class. So where, how, just name me one idea, I beg you, out of anti evidence that seems like it's a class analysis or an analysis of labor. Right. Division no, of labor. It's, well, yeah. Okay, my, my, um, I have to get my light on. Yeah, just, no, just no, one no, no. story. Just one yeah. idea. Yeah. Fair enough. Look, I'll, 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 I'll give you a few. First of all, you know, the, the text needs to be read in the context in which they were facing and you referenced some of it, the tragedy of Stalinism, the kind of crisis of state communism. The idea there was you could see how it would be abused by libertarians subsequently, because it's all about this kind of um, subterranean. It's a kind of different theory of a psychology of group, of group psychology, right? It's kind of taking Freud's group psychology and turning it on its head and going in a completely different direction. And number one, number two, it's working with Wilhelm Reich's theory of desire, which they claim is actually more in line with Marxism because it's much more um, non, it, it circumvents that familial repressive thing. And that's actually one of the things that I actually critique in Deleuze and Guattari, which is that they, they kind of seem to have a bit of a, um, too eager of a, a view that leads to a kind of paradoxical familialism. And it's no surprise that one of um, Foucault's disciples, this guy Jacques Donzelot, wrote a very interesting book on the family called The Policing of Families, where he makes a beautiful argument, which is basically post 70s capitalism is even like more Oedipal than it was before, because it's all this kind of like horizontal hierarchy or a uh, non-hierarchical family and so like the Oedipal thing is defective basically right so that's that's one L look I actually think it's important to read um subversively and not to read like it's a bible like I'm I'm a kind of like um cheerleader for this text I'm not saying that I'm not saying that number one I think I'm also I'm also getting the feeling from you Catherine that you think that French theory leads people into a labyrinth where they become monks and they're dissociated from active being active. Um, I'm not sure that that's true. And I don't mean to characterize what you're saying. No, but. no, the, it, it is true. And there is a really important monastic aspect to academia that I cherish. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the notion of like self motivated research, the way in which we can remove ourselves from the world. I want everyone to have that leisure time, that autonomy. There's nothing wrong with being a monk. There's nothing wrong with being in a monastery. There's nothing wrong with solving a research problem that, you know, is self-motivated. Um, so what you just said about anti-Oedipus just doesn't convince me. And no one's been able to convince me that there's a, an idea that's useful for me. Now, the anti-family stuff, I've been reading Christopher Lash's cultural, Culture of Narcissism again. And um, anti-Oedipus culture of narcissism and this book by Camille Kushner. Have you read this 
her um, memoir called La Familia Grande. I'm familiar. I haven't read it, but I'm familiar with the story. It's it's a okay. doozy. Go ahead. Yeah, it is go a ahead doozy. And, I'll yeah, summarize please. it. So she's the um, daughter of Bernard Kushner, and um, her mother was a big feminist. Her father founded um, um, Doctors Without Borders. And her stepfather, Olivier Duhamel, was the um, head of uh, philosophy at one of the most elite universities in Paris. And it turned out that um, he had spent you know, most of their adolescence ab sexually abusing her twin brother, whose identity is completely masked in this memoir because he no longer wants to have anything to do with this family. And in La Familia Grande, she describes, you know, being a member of the French elite, going to parties and um, being told that she should be naked with grown-ups and that there was just this freedom, this libidinal freedom, this breaking of the family that um, you could say applied anti-Oedipus might lead to. Um, what happens to her family is particularly tragic. Her aunt kills herself, her grandmother kills herself, her mother becomes an alcoholic. And um, one of the things that I was doing was reading Culture of Narcissism, which is Christopher Lash's book in the 70s, talking about sort of the countercultural cultivation of lifestyle and this kind of new American um, way of um, consuming transgression as politics. And I was thinking about how, um, you know, and he was talking about how the narcissistic personality is just very empty in the end. But one of the things about, um, um, this kind of permissiveness that was very peculiar to the French elites was that it was trying to break out of what was really a repressive Catholic family structure, right? Yeah. Extremely patriarchal, extremely um, 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 gendered, extremely closed in on itself. Like mm. there's not a lot of openness to other people. Every, you know, family traditions, family values, especially among the grand bourgeois were, you know, handed down. And you could see how, um, in that context, like um, anti-Oedipus might have been inspiring at some point. But what Lash says is that, you know, when you actually have no respect for traditions or no respect for given like ego ideals of the past, you really don't know how to invent yourself completely in the um, present. And this is part of the impasse, he says, of the hippies, of Abby Hoffman, of these transgressive 60s types. Yeah. But I was also thinking about the, sort of the libidinal impasse in Camille Kushner's life. Her father, the um, her stepfather who was abusing her brother, actually justified himself by saying that the mother couldn't satisfy him anymore because she was so depressed about her sister and mother's having committed suicide. And, she, and so um, he told her brother, because her brother later told her this, that, you know, this was just something that he could do to help him, you know, get rid of his libido to, to realize their libidos. And he was initiating him as a man. You know, there's a Socratic um, Greek tradition of, you know, the older philosopher initiating the younger philosopher, the ephebe through, um, there were 100,000 rationalizations for the sexual abuse that took place. And part of it could have been, you know, just um, getting rid of mama, papa, caca, we'll just mm -hmm. all be, your penis is my penis, is my vagina, right. we're in this fam beautiful family home in Provence, and right. we're just going to be enacting all of this stuff. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, this is gonna be me being very normy is that as a leftist who wants, you know, who wants to remake and really break the countercultural model of transgression, you know, we have to respect traditions in some way. We have to know when to break them, know when to um, um, respect them. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a general like disrespect. But when you her, you know, Camille Kushner talks about her mother and even her grandmother were like, oh, you know, you should never be with one man. You should have a kid and run around. You should never be repressed in the family. And she was like, this young woman who was rather conservative, like she wanted to do well in school. She want, she had a boyfriend, she married him, she wanted children. And the parents kept telling her, like, you have to be free, you have to be free. And at some point, you know, in Lash's you know, um, culture of narcissism, and I also think in Lacanian theory as well, like that, that, you know, injunction to be free, to transgress, leaves you completely bereft. Yeah. Culturally, libidinally, politically, whatever. And Kushner's memoir is like a really powerful um, documentation of that. I mean, I got my PhD in French. 
I was, you know, I went to, um, I attended classes as, as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student abroad. And you could feel that. And it was so seductive, you know, this idea of freedom having to do with sexual freedom, libidinal freedom. And, you know, but I didn't understand that this comes out of this, you know, repressive Catholic family. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with their um, hatred of conservative working class people. So I, now we I, jump okay. forward, okay. jump forward to Didier yeah. Eribon. Mm -hmm. He is um, Foucault's biographer. He's mm -hmm. queer. He just wrote a book called Return to Reims about mm. it's a, his memoir about being a working class gay kid right. in this very, very violent working class family in Northern France that has now gone far right. right. And you know what he says at the end of his um, book, he says, you know, um, it was harder for me to come out as working class in Paris than it was mm. for me to come out as gay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that's a very interesting reference. And look, one way to look at anti-Oedipus is Guattari is a Lacanian analyst himself. Deleuze is a philosopher. They make a partnership. Guattari, they're in a libertine moment, right? There's the context of May, the, there's a context of May 68. And there's been many Marxist critiques that have waged a similar line of analysis, mode of critique to yours, right? Who's, who's? I'd like to know because I want to read them. Well, largely, let, let me let me make a couple points of reference here. One is the liber well, the the question was that the sixty eight was a problem precisely because it centered the petty bourgeois subject and not the proletarian subject. It in the intellectuals of sixty eight, they actually made a decision to align more with the students over the workers. That's not true in all cases. If you take French philosopher who's kind of on the margins of American French theory is Alain Badiou. There were some um, pretty, I would say, righteous and noble efforts to organize workers. Like there's another reading of French 68, which sought to center the worker struggle in the factories. This is in like when things were much more industrial capitalist. Well, general. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't even say, let's not tell, talk it from the point of view of the intellectuals. The CGT, the um, Transit Workers Union, the Broadcast Workers Union, they joined the students. So in it wasn't just the work people organizing workers. The yeah. powerful French unions in '68, right. the Renault factory workers joined mm -hmm. the students. The mm -hmm. RTF joined the students. There was a lot more worker agency. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mm -hmm. just about the the um, students or intellectual centering workers. The workers were a powerful, powerful force. Yeah, they were a powerful force. And it was a kind of, Badiou describes it as a, a kind of aborted or failed unity between student and workers. And there was a kind of contradiction there. And I think that contradiction became couched within and supplanted within French theory in America. And I would say from a Marxist standpoint, it's interesting to me because it's really probably most useful to invoke the category of petty bourgeoisie as a form of um, kind of, supplanting or reactionary co-optation of the workers' struggle. And there's a whole history of that in the Second International that interests me a lot. Um, that's one thing that Christopher Lash was really interested in, which was what is in fact the American prehistory of the Bohemian petty bourgeois left. And it actually goes back to turn of the century uh, Greenwich Village intellectuals, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Randolph Bourne, I don't know mm -hmm. if you know his work. He's a mm -hmm. great kind of like, one of the first actual disability advocates, he was a great voluntarist mm -hmm. and he was one of the only intellectuals actually against the first world war, mm -hmm. but he used William James's theories to center the significance of personal experience. Hmm? It was very interesting because the idea there was that the proposition was the petty bourgeois position conceives of uh, liberation from the standpoint of personal experience, not tied to the material relations of the mode of production, and mm -hmm. then they universalize that mm -hmm. as the secret for workers. That's what I mean by they pollute the working class struggle because they make it about themselves, right? And they then they, they then universalize that mm -hmm. idea that personal experience can be can be it, and that's enough. And that workers just need so they they they, they theorize a form of leisure time, mm -hmm. which is not 
adequate to workers. It doesn't translate to workers. So it creates a rift. That rift didn't start in the 60s. It started before that. Mm -hmm. uh, is, the, is the thing that Lash really picks up on in some mm -hmm. of his historical work, not mm -hmm. uh, culture of narcissism. So I think that there's a way of critiquing that from Marx's standpoint. I think there's many critiques of that. Back to anti-Oedipus quickly. I think there's a char more charitable way to read it, which is a kind of libertine analysis of Lacanianism. That's really what the text is about. It's these two Lacanian dissidents, because remember, they created this alternative university, a way of uh, uh, Vincennes, where it was all of this kind of anarchical communist spirit and Lacan was outlawed by the International Psychoanalytic Association. They brought him there and he said his famous thing in 1967, which is all of you anarchist kids are going to, you really want a new master. And then he became a kind of fascination for them because, you know, like he really problematized their whole mode of petty bourgeois personal revolt. So I think that there's a more um, interesting way to read anti-Oedipus as a, as a Lacanian text, right? As a kind of left Lacanian project, we can assess its success, its failures, etc. But it's nonetheless quite interesting because it's a conceptually rigorous one. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know what? I'll, I'll give you that, but I find it really boring and unreadable. I'm sorry. It is hard. Yeah. It, is, it is dense. And I think that it can lead to a kind of hermeticism. So that's, and, that's a fair point. And you know what? It's like, um, yeah, anyway, so we'll just have to agree to disagree on that. That's okay. And, but I do think that it took a lot, it absorbs a lot of energy um, in academia. It yeah. uh, pulled a lot of people in this direction that, you know, you're right to talk about in terms of libertinage and the libertine yeah. sensibility. I think, you know, we're in a phase of incredible... Um, Puritan backlash. And so is there a way of talking about pleasure and um, libido in academia that's adequate to it? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I, I agree. Well, all right. One of the people, the only person I know who can do that adequately, historically and theoretically, is Mikhail Bakhtin in his mm. um, notion about carnival and the dialogism of carnival. Mm. 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 That's helpful. Yeah. I actually think uh, speaking of a French theory, he's not a part of French theory. He's more recent. He recently died. Bernard Stiegler. He has this kind of argument that contemporary... He is part of French theory. He was a student of Derrida's. No, I know, but he wasn't like a master name because he's younger than those guys. Um, you know what I mean? He wasn't one of the big, the big ones. But nonetheless, he's important. And actually, his daughter has an incredible book about the Walter Lippmann-John Dewey debate, which everybody needs to, to take a look at um, because it shows that the the Dewey Lippmann debate, um, which was like around the First World War period, set the left wing um, ideology of, of what would become neoliberalism, which we rarely talk about. Um, we usually talk about like Hayek and, you know, all that. Anyways, uh, Stiegler says, Bernard says, capitalism now is actually devoid of desire. It's much more of this like depressed thing. So like, the Deleuze and Guattari thing actually may be part of the reason why it doesn't hit us or resonate so much is because capitalism has kind of killed off desire in a certain way. Um, and that goes back to that question of superego. And I actually write about that in the last couple chapters of my book as well. But can we make it? Doesn't, a it, doesn't, it doesn't really go back to the notion of superego. I'm going to talk about it another go ahead. way. Go ahead. Go the, ahead. Um, the, 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 the quest, the um, personal computer, the algorithms around Tinder have tried to um, massage, tried to create a kind of immediacy with regard to desire that has reified any notions of intersubjectivity and made them both readable to algorithmic surveillance and read and um, readable to um, the social media companies that rule our worlds. So one of the reasons why capitalism has killed desire, if you want to just make this generalized statement, is that you? it seems like um, our objects of desire are so immediately available to us. Pornhub has, um, and all the tubes that provide every single possible perversion are available to you via the internet right now. So this is the only, so um, the Financial Times actually did an incredible analysis of the evolution of the porn industry. So I keep trying to 
bring us down to earth in some way, Daniel. And I know that it's very tiresome for you, but you know, to make these grand theoretical generalizations look sounds it it it's very libidinally attractive, and also to have a real um, understanding of um, what those things means means to unpack them a little bit. I'm sorry I'm, if I'm very very polemical no, 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 and antagonistic. No, no, I, I, it's okay. no, no, no. I think I, I'm happy with I, your analysis. I need to be that because Please. what Please. Tinder and Grinder and all of these things do is create an immediacy of satisfaction that leaves intersubjectivity and desire um, in abeyance because we know human desire is about um, the obstacle. It's about transgression. It's about breaking through the um, the no of the father. And if there's no prescription, if there's no prohibition anymore, um, yes, that's one way in which it's reduced desire. The other thing that's happened is it's documented now that kids are not people having less sex than they've ever right. had before. Right. And yet right. there's more porn available. And our fingers was like, I could watch porn right now if I wanted to. You sure. could watch porn right You could be watching, we could both be watching porn right now, <laughs> right? And any kind of porn that we wanted, we could be watching hentai porn, we could be watching threesome porn, we could be watching, you know, um, every, every formulation because the right. tube channels have made it available. Right. Now those channels have made it harder for sex workers to make money, They've created more profitability mm. for platforms. They made it easier to pirate um, pornographic content. So actually the working conditions of sex workers in the porn industry mm -hmm. has have gotten worse, mm. but the profitability of the platforms and the availability to the consumer of these things have gotten better. Yeah. So I just feel like if we, when you say something, I'm going to push you a little bit no, further. No, no. Look, because I, to I'm make gonna... cryptic statements about capital is not enough. Now, the other thing is, I am totally against LaCloud and Moof. Like, if you've read my book, American I, you don't have to have read it, but I am totally against their particular post-Marxism. -Marx, post and I try to understand populism with regard to anti-intellectualism and the evolution of higher education. Um, I, I believe that they are part of the cultural turn that moves us away from class analysis. And so, you know, you, you can like move in Laclau and I'm just going to say, no, no, I, I'm, you know, I no, look, look, first yeah. of all, no wrong. I, 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 I want to, I want to start off by saying, I really admire your fiery spirit and it's really refreshing to engage with you. I wasn't trying to sit, sort of throw out a kind of platitude and leave it at that. No, actually, I don't think it's reducible only to technology. Why, why late capitalism has killed desire. It's, okay. it's, it's also um, endemic to a broader post-industrial socialization of institutional yeah. and familial relations. And that is what I mean there. And you referenced it earlier where I think a better, not better, because I think Lacan also gives a great hint about the way that commodification and reification, which is really what you're talking about when it comes to technology consumption, um, alienates and can create this kind of depressive thing. But I would say, actually, it is absolutely still about super egoic identifications, precisely in the sense that um, the super ego is now much more acephalic. It's much more unclear, exactly. Uh, in a way, you could say it's a kind of deprivation or a loss of stable, familial super egos. And they're, um, they've... They've been so thrown off from their um, uh, capacity to inculcate subjectivity into anything like a stable social order that there's all of this. This is kind of proliferation. So it's a crisis over superego as well. And I actually think that that actually tracks with the technology piece. But I wouldn't want to reduce it just to like technology, because then if we do that, our theory is kind of just based on a kind of the subject qua consumer, you know, and I think maybe uh, a broader analysis. We are, we are consumers first. We are. Know? The subject is consumer. But the other thing is like to reduce, um, to think of um, techno reductionism as a kind of reductive thing. And then there's a subject outside of it is to say that the apparatuses and the infrastructure of even our conversations is not important because we're communicating through the pure ether of language or communication and Lacan himself would disagree with that you know there is a technological superego 
there's yep. censorship that goes on within mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. frames. Mm -hmm. I mean, this infrastructure is what supports our yeah. communication. Yeah. So um, I don't think there's technology redu reduction on the one hand and desiring subject rich proliferation on the other. The other thing is, like you say, oh, Lacan hints at this stuff. You know who doesn't hint at reification? Lukács. Oh, Lukács yeah. is actually yeah. a brilliant theorist of literature, literary history, and he's the great theorist of reification. Yeah. yeah. And of the I bourgeois agree. subject as um, um, in its, and, and bourgeois culture in relationship to all these social forms. Ab so um, one of the things that you could say is that you could say that that infrastructure is the symbolic order now, if you mm -hmm. wanted to really fit it into a Lacanian thing. Yeah, I don't know could. what that gains us, but if you want to stick to Lacanianism, then you could say the infrastructure of communication right now is mm -hmm. not simply language, but the digital medium through which we are um, put into contact with each other, through which we have these little faces, your yep. face, my face on a screen. It's, it's a rectangle. It looks like a, um, um, a window. Mm -hmm. um, it promotes the illusion of communication. And so one of the things that Lacan would want to do with that, because then when, when in the clips that you showed of him on television is he would say, let's fuck that up, right? Let's, mm -hmm. this is what I'm, you know, my discourse is not reasonable discourse. I'm speaking to analysts. I'm speaking to the analytic discourse. I'm speaking to the discourse of the unconscious. And right. so we look for, you know, we look for the unconscious and our unconscious does find us on these interfaces. You know, I'm always, I'm checking to see what's happening on my phone all the time because that endorphin rush of recognition is this kind of little bit of a pellet that gives mm. my narcissism a kind of stimulation. Yeah. So if you want it to be, so I'm I'm going to give you the the Delisian theory that you know um, I was asking for. We are reduced to these surface um, reactions to like oh the likes on my social media. We are reduced to very very surface stimuli. And the celebration of that liberal teen stimuli, you know, the serotonin that I get when I look at, I've got, you know, this many followers or I've got a like on Facebook does take us into a kind of um, body without organs, if you like, that's pure skin. I respond purely to this, this tiny endorphin rush. And you could say that that, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and be like theory, bro theory, bro. And just say, oh, yes, that is the body without organs because I am just responding to the screen. I am a screen. You are a screen. Ping. I like that. I like that simulation. That's all I have. I yeah. don't have any more genital differentiation. Now, the old school, the old school, like Freud, not Lacan, mm -hmm. Lash, Lash and Freud, and me would say one of the things that's so difficult to achieve as a human being is um genital differentiation is to understand like first of all that we are mortal our genitals make us part of the system mm -hmm. the gender system it makes us susceptible to desire and lack for in, in with regard to other people and it creates this kind of there's this internal hormonal thing that happens when we have secondary sex um characteristics that makes us more than the sort of narcissistic egg that we are born into and that achievement of genital maturity that Freud talks about seems very bourgeois, very anti-liberty. That is an achievement of civilization, is an achievement of symbolization. It mm -hmm. makes us, it puts us in the world, puts mm -hmm. us in a family, puts us in a structure where we do have to identify with our unconscious. Yeah. And, and Dylan Gortari say, no, fuck all that. Let's just be eggs. Well, no, they, um, so they, I, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm okay. caricaturing it, but I'm actually yeah. giving you the right. reading of how the smartphone has turned us all into these very superficial design machines where, you know, food comes in, food goes out, stimulation comes in, I, I'm undifferentiated, I just desire, yeah. you know, come and, you know, be, eat of me, I eat of you, and I just sit here, you know, into my... You know, totally jacked polymorphous perversity. The concept is called polymorphous perversity. No, okay. Is, so no, let me, let me let me let me just quickly explain. It's very it's a very interesting idea actually, which is that um, the human being, according to Lacan, 
is kind of born without a coherence of what um, all of these kind of erogenous zones in our body actually like they don't have a kind of um, logic of unification. There's no it, differentiation right? between the self and the org and the orifice when yeah, we're born. It, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So then this is the mirror stage produces this effect that kind of coheres a wholeness onto us. Okay, but, can I interrupt you for one second? Let, let, that that's a very it. Lacanian can... reading. That's not the Freudian reading. The Freudian reading of polymorphous perversity is very, very different. But I will, I will, you know, let you go on. Let, let me I'll just, just say, register my difference from you can, you can, idea. you can, you can fire back in a moment. But let me just say this: uh, libertine psychoanalytic thinkers, Deleuze and Guattari, Wilhelm Reich, others have Norman O'Brown, mm -hmm, American, uh, interesting figure have found a theory of liberation as a kind of return to this state. And I think what's interesting is that part of what's missing in our conversation here is the way that capitalism, and you see this in a wonderful book by Luke Boltansky and Eve Chiapello, The New Spirit of Capitalism, where they say, look, these ideas of 68, these libertine ideas actually were co-opted, right? They were kind of, they were, they were used in business literature management, like Deleuze and Guattari was used by the IDF, it was used in military, like, so ideas matter, right? So it's like, you know, that's very, very interesting to recognize, right? And um, I think I think that's a missing element here, which is that, do you think that Deleuze and Guattari would be celebrating? They would not be celebrating what you're articulating. It is a tragic outcome of a project which was writing for militant li um, libertine left-wing groups their their whole theory of the line of flight they got from george jackson okay uh the american uh sort of muse of the black panther party right who wrote his uh, soledad brother reflections which are actually quite poetic and powerful um when he was imprisoned so look okay can this I stuff, this stuff was co-opted and we need to honor that and 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 find out what went wrong how okay, was can i okay i'm going to go back to polymorphous go ahead, go ahead. Say, it's a stage of development it's yeah. a regressive we're all where all of our orifices are pleasure orifices every single one of our zones, every single orifice that opens up to the outside from the mouth to the anus to the vagina are all sources of po potential pleasure and it's only as we get older or from you know infant year from day zero mm -hmm. to day twenty one to year twenty one let's say or I think they say the human brain really matures after twenty five there's a pure there's an a necessary differentiation repression organization mm -hmm. that has to take place mm -hmm. now if you have the libertine psychoanalysts as you say who fetishize regression and infantilism. I don't see that there's a good outcome to that line of thinking. I, unlike you, maybe I don't like regression. I don't like infantilism. I actually believe in genital maturity okay. for the purposes of political engagement. Okay. I don't think rolling around with other eggs is going to produce a better world for us. Okay. So okay. sorry, I'm just I'm let just me, agreeing me, very fundamentally with a lot of things you're saying because I, no. like Lacan, want to return to Freud. I don't think Lacan is the end all and be all. I think actually Freud is the end all and be all of this if you want to push me hard enough. So okay. I don't okay. usually okay. talk about this okay. a lot, but you're I done. I think first of all, we're having a conversation. I'm not endorsing these views. I just said really? okay. I think no, look, I think that Deleuze and Guattari should be taken seriously. I think a lot of this stuff is quite rigorous and worth looking at critically, so, as I mentioned. Am I endorsing that theory of liberation? I don't think it's as easy to say that I endorse it, yes or no. I think it's more complex in the sense that people are going to be drawn to it. I mean, there's all kinds of, um, I mean, have you ever read about the peasant revolts of the Middle Ages and all of the kind of wild polymorphous perverse, like look at the movement of the free spirits in France, for example, in the Middle Ages. So, Revolutionary subjectivity uh, decodes uh, sexual codes. That's a fact of history. It's a fact of 
life. I don't think that we have the power to direct or steer that. Therefore, it's quite important, in my opinion, to create an olive branch of dialogue and understanding with that community of people on the left. Because Which I think community when, of people? Which one? Liber today, there are there or are there not libertine leftists amongst us. And I would say that there is. I think that they've they've changed. They don't, they don't look the same as the 60s and 70s. But nonetheless, I think we run into a problem because when... I want to Let me say one example. Let me say one example. No, no, I'm asking you, what organization, what group, name names, who are they? Why should well, I be I'll, I'll, give you an example. I'll give you an example. Okay. The 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 um, widely popular work of Sophie Lewis and family abolition. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. The transgender Marxist community. I think, you know, there's there's a sign, and and some of those communities need to. Uh, we need to communicate and dialogue with them in part because one of the interesting things about the, this is kind of a side point, but it interests me and Lash picks up on this a lot as a historical point, which is if a petty bourgeois conception of revolution, which centers personal experience, as I mentioned, one of the other things that they did was they centered the significance of adolescence, adolescence. And that in a way has created a strange conundrum, Right. In the, in the kind of historical way that adolescence has been elevated, and there's a whole history of how adolescence was elevated as an ideal in the Nazi regime. Larry Rickles has done some incredible stuff on that. What I'm saying is that um, libertine leftists, need we need to take their thought seriously and not alienate them, because when you do alienate them, what ends up happening is that you will get accused of basically being a kind of red brownist. Right? Okay, so we're in and, this internecine left debate, and I don't want to engage with them either way. I've been accused of being a red brownist, and I've survived it. Um, but what I want to talk, what I think, what I, my question is, how do we build a mass movement? Yeah. And a lot of these libertine leftists are content with being subcultural. I'm just very normie. I'm a very yeah. normie person. I believe in certain normative issue, normative forms. Mm -hmm. I believe that if you have normative forms and you can have transgressions of norms, mm -hmm. I believe in, you know, the unconscious and I believe in the, um, in maturity so that transgression can work. I and think if that makes me a red brownist, then you know what? They're my enemy because is... they, if they want to accuse me of that, then that's, you know, that's kind of on them. See, I'm going to say that what you're being is very, um, professional manager of class. You're trying to manage differences in the left. And there's actually just um, intense antagonism and contradiction. And I can live with that. I okay. can live with that. Catherine, I think, I don't know if that's fair. I think rather what I'm trying to do is recognize that when we stake down a conceptual principle such as this one, mm -hmm. we run the risk of alienating comrades, number one. Number two. Let me ask you this. Let's start at it from another angle. Let's look at the problem from another angle. Does a socialist revolution imply a break from repression? Okay, we're in a post-repressive society. Very, very good. That's actually not exactly right. Right. In other words, are, are we committed to a thorough revolutionary subject transformation, a, transform a, trans a transformative possibility? Is socialism going to present that? I think the psychoanalysis shows that it that it does. You know, like socialist revolution needs to be addressing sexual difference, addressing these things in a very progressive, in a very very um, good way. And I think that it remains it remains quite central. And not to not only be that there's that reason, but also because this is like hugely inescapable today this is the discourse i mean like you know i i, I think that we run a risk of that now we're going into the pmc ideology terrain um based on what you just said but yes i think that a olive branch and a kind of dialogue is important here because i i generally support much of the insights of what you're saying from freud and lash i'll give you an example no no can i say something though can please, i say please. something 
Okay, so you talked about how does the social revolution, socialist revolution um, entail the liberation of the libido or emancipation? Correct. You know what would do? You know what would do wonders for that is actually economic security for people and universal health care. I hate to be so banal, but so many people I know, and especially among the PMC, um, remain in relationships today because their material assets, once separated, will reduce them in class structure. Many, many working class families also have this problem because of health care, right? Women remain in abusive relationships when their husbands carry health care. When, when you have universal health care, a kind of economic security for all, you will have libidinal freedom because you won't be tied because the marriage institution or partnership institution between um, non-straight people won't be tied towards material assets. Look at Buttigieg and Ch Chasen, whatever. Chasen's not going to leave Buttigieg, even if he's an asshole, because his health insurance is related to Pete. Now they have a kid and they show and it's show and it's within um all the studies that have been done about rates of divorce since the 70s have shown that rates of divorce among college educated people um, are going down. And so you think, OK, they have really stable relationship. But one of the things is it takes a two earner family to maintain an upper middle class family value. So when you have enough assets, um, then you it's more pragmatic to stay together. Think mm. about it. If we liberated people from the economic um, chains of like this kind of asset combination, or if we mm -hmm. liberated the working class from um, the chains of um, health insurance and also the family wage, then you would really have an explosion of the libido. It's not really that obscure. This mm -hmm. is universal single payer healthcare should be our priority because there'll be nothing that will free people from unwanted partnerships and other partnerships than that, mm -hmm. and also like affordable housing so that my housing isn't tied up to my partner. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I, I agree with you. that, like I'm trying to make it like really talk about the material structures of um, the sexual, the psychosexual bond. And so it'd be great to have everyone, you know, fucking everyone else, but let's have single payer first. Fair enough, but how do you get to single payer without making broad solidarity, broad coalitions with people for whom like the sometimes I worry in the PMC framework of thinking about how ideology functions, which I have much sympathy to Catherine. Sometimes I do worry though, is that much of the energy of revolt of antagonism to the system, etc. And, and they people frame it differently. Maybe they don't frame it socialistically, I think we had a debate on Twitter where I said that socialism as an ideology has stakes today. And you said, actually, it doesn't have stakes today because people don't believe in socialism. And that actually hits a heart of something I want to raise with you, which is if that's true, right, isn't it important to convince that wide swath of people who may have all of these problematic aesthetic ways of thinking about injustice and suffering and they don't care about the working class and xyz okay that may be true and that may be problematic but how the hell are you going to to change their mind okay so i'm going to change gonna, their mind you want me to change the minds of other i don't want you people. to how are we going no no, no. okay are well we you want the abstract me to you want us to change to persuade um other people within the pmc who are sort of more on the libertine left to come to our side. I'm not quite sure what our side is, but okay, to come to a more materialist analysis. And so you want to have this fight within 25% of the population, or maybe even a smaller of the working population. And then there's 75% of people in America who haven't gone to college, who are not having this debates, who cannot have, who have no idea what we're talking about, but who are struggling to survive. And I should just not worry about them and I should try to continue to have a debate to convince Sophie Lewis that she and I are on the same side. Yeah, is that what you're saying? Or like the Delizians might, you know, in some department, I don't know where the Delizians, to convince the Delizians that we have a socialist project together that we should build on. And what I'm saying is, I'm done with that. Like, 
this is my position. I have stakes here. I'm sorry you're worried that I am alienating people because they alienate me to begin with. But then, you know, we can still, when there's a campaign, when there's a political issue, I can put aside my differences, work together. But if they, but there has to be a concrete political project. And other than that, I'm really trying to understand how 75% of the American population is struggling to survive right now. And I identify with their problems. Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry. I just, that, that's just the way I am. And the fig leaf, the dialogue, all that stuff. Um, I wish it were like that, but I feel like they're very much more prone to call me names than I am to call them names. And um, I live in academia. So all of these ideas that you're talking about have a lot of currency within academia. And um, I, you know, I object to them. And I have a critical attitude towards that kind of the cultivation of a kind of subcultural, transgressive, theory driven lifestyle leftism. I would say they might call me a Nazbol. I don't know why, why is the left tearing itself apart like this? I just want to try to build a project or actually, I don't even know if I'm trying to build a project. I just want to do work that adds to the general intellect about history and historical materialism. Um, give strength to people who want to do cost analysis. And really, like, I'm trying to stay out of those fights. I'm really Fair trying enough. to stay out of those Fair fights. enough. I, I'm trying to work within both. And we don't need to use the kind of sappy or romantic language of Olive Branch or anything like that. But I think it does matter to convince people of the centrality of working class struggle. Like, that requires to good theory, which is another thing about theory that matters from a Marxist standpoint, in my view. So I think that um, it's not so much about this kind of fake unity or dialogue or something like that, but it's also about recognizing, I think, another thing, which is um, what I call ultra liberalism, which is the tendency in which a lot of like libertine politics have a strange tendency to secretly submit to status quo authority relations at the end of the day. And um, that's something that I've written about. And that kind of uh, seems uh, deeply problematic to me, obviously. And um, uh, in the sense that like nobody is kind of culpable or responsible, right? Like I was very concerned with um, how Biden became a kind of great tamer of all of the Floyd spirit. And that was very ironic to me that the protests stopped when Biden came into power. It was very concerning to me. I didn't, it felt to me like a big contradiction. So I think, um, whatever the discourse on the left, the, the PMC, all of this stuff, like there is so much, uh, gradients of diversity. There's so many PMC that are from working class backgrounds for whom their working class background doesn't mean anything within the discourse. It's a very interesting fact, <laughs> like there's no significance to that. Very interesting also that Mark Fisher's essay on the vampire castle, that was one of his main contentions because he was siding with Russell Brand. He said, no, actually, Russell Brand may be a millionaire now, but the lessons of his working class background actually matter. And that really made people mad. Really, you right? I don't know if you remember that. It was very interesting to me. One of the most moving responses to my book has to do with working class academics, intellectual PMC types, who have um, recognized their rage in my book. That's been one of the most amazing responses. People from all different walks of life, lawyers, doctors, they say they can't talk about this in public, but they come from working class backgrounds. You know what we call them in the university now? First gen. We want to assimilate working class people into this order. Mm. And we want to honor all other kinds of difference, but mm. we want to assimilate Mm. working class people. Mm. And one of the things that I'm, you know, glad that I was able to do is um, write for that audience, because there is no audience for that. You, you, there is no your, constituents. For do that you consider audience. yourself a part of that audience? Yeah. Okay. I wrote it for myself in a way, you yeah. know? Yeah. I always thought of your book kind of like an Antigone type of book. <laughs> and I mean, I, I respect it for that reason. And um, but you you allowed for a conversation to take place, which I think is very valuable. Um, well, it's more like um, 
I, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, there isn't really a constituency because there isn't really a party. There isn't an organization. But I feel like if you can, if you provide the right political analysis, it's not about necessarily persuasion, but it is about like creating um, a kind of an account of politics that many, many people recognize themselves in. And um, it's not organized right now, but I, you know, the disappointment, the disillusionment of working class um, um, people who worked so hard to enter into the professions and then find that the professions are just betrayals of the very liberal ideals that they profess to um, um, espouse and create. Mm -hmm. That's one of the greatest betrayals and we sh and that energy we should partake in. And I think that that is really an important political um, energy that I want to cultivate. So anything that, um, not cultivate, and, and encourage people to think about themselves in this way and encourage that kind of readership. I mean, proclaiming you, you um, yourself, you know, um, in dialogue with certain people or, you know, um, worried about things, that's not, that's not my, the, a language that I'm going to use. I'm using a language of antagonism, polemics, and proofs. And I do think that I use the language of persuasion and reason. I don't ask anyone to ascribe to anything that I say just on the basis of belief or just because I say it. Mm -hmm. All my references are there. You can read the references. And um, I have doctors, lawyers who are writing me like I have $100,000 worth of um, you know, student loan debt. I have to get a residency. And my time with patients, it, I didn't come into this profession to clock in and out 15 minute increments with patients. I can't care for people because the administration of medical care in this country is preventing me from doing this. Who believes in these kinds of, you know, the nobility of the professions, actually working class people who enter the professions. When you have people with social and cultural capital whose parents are white collar workers, you're much more able to navigate the sort of cynicism of the kind of PMC self-interest that we see. So when you say you're worried about my alienating people within, you know, the subcultural libertine left, I'm not that worried anymore because I've never been able to convince them and I never can fit in. They're like the cool kids at school. I'm not cool like that. You know, you say that I'm very um, animated and, um, you know, in um, passion about what I say. It's like the very style of my um, locutions is not um, assimilable to this kind of very measured um, argumentation that liberals and PMC want, but mm -hmm. I'm not being irrational. You know, it's just a different style of communication. And um, I can't assume that this is a, a recumbent position that we're just abstractly discussing ideas and we can come to an agreement. I've, read, I've written this. We are in a five alarm emergency with regard to the suffering of working class people, with regard to the energy crisis in this country, with regard to American imperialism abroad. It, and there is no recumbent like um, a conversation that can be had. It's either you are critical of the situation and you want to throw in your lot with um, the, the needs and the suffering of the majority of Americans who are working class, non-college educated people, or you want to um, convince other people that you're the best Marxist or you're the best leftist or you're the most pure um, criti critical person. I mean, Vivek Chibber said this in, about um, class matrix. It's like not, when we articulate the question of class or critique, it's not about like trying to modify our message to convince people based on polling or focus group. It's about creating critique that people will recognize and understand that leftism is our inherited legacy, that we join the rest of, that we join human history in its great struggle for emancipation, that there are enemies and antagonists out there who want to strip the majority of human beings from of their dignity and their leisure time, and that we should be participating in the grand historical struggle, an epic struggle, if you like, um, Hegelian and Marxist, however you want to look at it, for human emancipation. Bravo. I, li I, li I, but I'm in, I'm not, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I think that was a nice, um, a, a very nice uh, point, I, I guess. What I what I want to stress is that being serious in the world of ideas matters. 
It matters. Right. I agree. It matters. It matters. And you know, these the 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 line of argumentation since Bernie that the centrality of working class is a new thing, and it is making people in this country quite uncomfortable. We do lack a kind of way of relating to that question, right? And I mean, I'm from a working class background. My entire family, when I start to do this stuff, it makes them shameful. They start to turn against me. They get quite uncomfortable. Slowly things click and quietly they will point to me and say, you are right. But I don't know how to say that you're right. I don't know how to, I don't know how to be that you're right. Right. I don't know how to exist in the world with this new thing, but you know, in their heart, they feel it, but that's not enough. Right. They do need, we do need to go beyond just the heart recognition. That, 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 that to me is the question on the working class question. Um, and I'm not sure how to do that. We do have the, the weight of history working against us, I feel. And I wanted to ask you what you think about that in this country. Like, what have you been looking at historically? And you're interested in trauma. That's interesting. What do you, what do you think? Like, what are the good prospects of, I don't know, maybe like historical examples of building working class consciousness. I was just on sublation, pro the program talking about class consciousness. And I think it's worth talking, like talk about theory. We can move from a set of theory di which didn't talk about class consciousness into one that does and be serious about that. What, what would you say to like that question? I know. Well, well here's, a, that here's something that's, yeah. it, you know, what's really interesting and what I thought, and it still could happen is that, you know, in 1947, there were 4 million Americans on strike in any given time. The majority of American workers were working class people and their sense of um, what they deserved had a lot to do with the fact that they were the ones who went to war. They were the ones who built the ships and the airplanes and the bombs that um, defeated the Nazis. And there was a sense of blue collar entitlement and the um, elites were really worried about this kind of worker unrest and worker revolt. Many concessions were made. And this is also what created um, by, you know, the worker unrest and the need for a redistributive um, state, as well as, you know, the Cold War created the top income, percentage top income bracket in 1961 that was at 90%. If you were in the top income bracket, which means in 61, you made $400,000 a year, which is probably like a million, $2 million, $3 million today, um, you were taxed at 90%. So it was a progressive income tax. Um, Ronald Reagan really destroyed that in 1980. He brought it way, way down. But um, that kind of worker unrest really produced like policy changes within the United States. We, you know, in the typical American um, history idea, I don't even know if people have this anymore because kids don't even think about the 20th century. Um, they think it's like, you know, the stone age, but um, we think of the 1950s as a real, you know, quiescent time. It's the time when the teenage consumption um, image really takes over the culture industry, but it's actually a time of enormous achievement for, um, returning GIs of all uh, African American migration to the industrial Midwest and um, California, and um, we think of that time as being, you know, um, quiescent. But what that level of um, social stability produced was the kind of libidinal unrest of '68. But in 1972 with the rate of profit falling in the United States, there were macroeconomic economists who said, we have to stop this. And one way of stopping um, worker unrest was to undermine job security, undermine industrial jobs, export them abroad, create, um, and the people who oversaw that were professional managerial class people, were managers, financiers, engineers, um, from um, the Federal Reserve all the way down. And it can, that, um, those policies went from Nixon to Carter to Reagan to Clinton, which are policies of public austerity, um, financialization, and deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. None of these things happen by accident, right? They're mm -hmm. man made, um, human made, if you like. So mm -hmm. we need to understand our history. Now, as we come out of COVID, it seems like we're never coming out of COVID. 
But there was, there's this famous worker shortage. There's an enormous amount of unionization and enormous amounts of worker unrest. And the frontline workers should say, logistics workers should say, you know, we got, we kept working. We got everyone out of this mess. Nurses should say that we deserve more. Now, but what's happening is, and you're going to see this in the next few years, and, you know, this is going to kill the Democratic prospects in 2024, is we have incredible rates of inflation. And what is the Federal Reserve going to do to punish inflation and, and growing wages? Austerity. They, so rather than giving workers more, they're going to say, oh, ra- rising wages is causing inflation, so mm. we must stop the quantitative easing, we mm. must stop the money flows, we have to turn off all the spigots, raise the interest rates, and then that will cool the economy, somehow miraculously bring the prices down. In the meantime, Americans whose wages have not been con- keeping up with the rates of inflation since 72 are go- going to just suffer more. Now, the, the kinds of worker unrest and organization that that kind of punishing internal shock doctrine um, austerity is going to cause, you can, we can either be ready to meet worker unrest and American unrest mm. with open arms and organization, or we can turn away and say our political, um, the masses didn't live up to our dreams, they're Trumpy, we're going to cultivate subcultural forms of um, transgression. We can't, we are, in inter- if we think of ourselves as an intellectual left cadre, we cannot turn away from this level of, um, of um, economic suffering that's going to take place and is taking place right now, but it's mm-hmm. going to be more intensified. Mm-hmm. It's impossible for people to make a living, young people mm-hmm. to make a living right now. Um, median rents in New York City are $4,000 mm-hmm. a month. The median home price in Orange County, where I live, is a million dollars. Mm. Those of us who are grandfathered in, who are older, who are part of you know um, owning something, are benefiting from this. But we have a generation of younger people coming up in the world with no prospects mm. of any kind of stability at all. You can be anti-family. They're not going to start a family because they can't afford rent. Right. They're right. living in their parents' basement or they're living outside out of their vans. You know, so I... I feel like there are just serious material issues, worker unrest that we can be there for, or mm. we can say like, I want to be a French theorist. No. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, be, I'm parodying that. But the, the whole thing is like understanding the historical senses mm-hmm. of disappointment in the mm-hmm. 70s that mm-hmm. made left intellectuals embrace post-structuralism or you know, the, um, the spectacle in mm-hmm. the, the board sense is, um, a path that I hope we will not follow, a mistake that we will not make again. Well, look, I don't I don't think that the French post-structuralism affected the socialist left as much as it affected the culture industry and academia, which is kind of a different animal, right? Mm-hmm. Like another thing we didn't talk about, which is important to flag, is that, you know, the concept of people are lower class or their POC, et cetera, and they are marginalized, the concept of marginalization. In Cousset's book, he shows that marginalization as a theory mm. in part came from French theory. Yep. The way that we think, and this is like everything from like AmeriCorps to like you name the NGO yep. framework of yep. marginalization, we owe to French theory. So I think French theory is not just like, is anti-Oedipus wrong or is it is it good for socialism? No, we're talking about a huge cultural, the way we look at texts, the way mm. we look at canons. We haven't talked about ca- the canon wars, canon formation, how we look at the right. role so, of the so question, of, even using that verb center or decenter comes out of this theory of like centers and margins that comes out of French theory. Absolutely. And, you know, it's got a limited life. It's got a limited, you know, um, um configuration of power i mean mm. foucault's whole notion of power and space mm. is really yeah. you know um has really um it, i want to say infected inflected like um language um in left liberal circles i mean this is what um john and barbara Ehrenreich wrote about in 1977 it was that these college educated white collar elites were going to take over left liberal political circles and then they took they took those circles over with a lot of French theory. 
and mm. it shaped the way that we think about antagonism. Mm. It shapes the way we think about difference. Yeah. It shapes the way we think about performance. You know, so um, yeah, it, it is very, very powerful. Um, it's good to understand where this language comes from. And I do think that, you know, the educational system and the way that it um, rations education out is part of the problem. Mm. Because part of, you know, being initiated into this language means being willing to take on student loan debt or coming from families that allow you to um, be educated in this way that allows you to speak language without student loan debt. And I'm just like trying to figure out like what is popular education? Maybe it's, you know, getting on line and doing things like this, but um, I'm really um, engaged in what I think will be, is like a difficult, but not intransparent mode of critique and theory. I think it's good. I mean, uh, one question I had for you, Catherine, is have you thought about, you know, this theory I mentioned before of how theories and ideas get co-opted, like the new spirit of capitalism thesis, right? What worries you about how the right might co-opt the PMC thesis? Have you thought about that? I mean, obviously they already have going back to James Burnham and Bannonism is kind of... No, no. You know what? Okay, tell, can, me, tell me, tell me, tell um, me. Herman Kahn came up with the idea of the new class before the Ehrenreichs did. And he in 71 is a right conservative guy said there's going to be, there is this new class or liberal elites, they jet around the world and they're going to be alienating um, the working class. So is that what you're talking about? Like, so, so then these conservative thinkers are actually referring back to Herman Kahn and they're showing like these liberal elites are very divorced from the working class. So you're saying that what I'm saying is what I'm the, saying, like what I'm saying is that if we create a theory of the urgency of addressing the working class question in this country, and we use the framework of the PMC ideology framework that you've developed here, you know, I think folks like JD Vance and people can abuse that and do a kind of shallow anti elitism, which we know what that looks like on the right. I'm just curious, like, how would you? How do you kind of fortify your position by making like clear delineations? Like, no, 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 that's taking things in the wrong direction. Like, how do you prevent your critique from being co-opted by the right? Okay, so the whole idea of co-optation is the like, thing I have problems with because it's like people, you know, there's an idea that you, you're pure and then you're, what your ideas are pure and then they're co-opted by somebody else. So that also comes out of the 60s, like, you know, people worried about their art being co-opted or their ideas being co-opted. We live in a complex world, right? Their liberalism, the Democratic Party doesn't want to talk about class, it wants to talk about other forms of difference. So the right wing is very opportunistic. They come in and they um, very opportunistic, they pick up on some of these ideas of the working class and they weaponize them or they use them to foment cultural resentment. We know that formula. That right. formula, it doesn't scare me. Um, I'll go toe to toe with Bannon any day and argue about, um, you know, social and economic justice based on class. He and I will totally disagree at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of that argument. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about the right wing critique and its opportunism is it's dialectically in response to the Democratic Party and liberals repressing the class question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and actually having contempt for working class people. Mm -hmm. So we have to create a left that builds on working class issues and rejects the liberal order and the right and the conservative order mm -hmm. and names the conservative opportunistic resentment mm -hmm. as just pure opportunistic resentment that still um, works on protecting the interests of corporate elites, of the capitalist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing that a lot of working class people deal with much more, they don't deal with like actual capitalists. They deal with PMC types, social workers, lawyers, um, professors, teachers, right? Doctors. So they are, when they're treated with contempt by these people and then by the democratic liberal elite, where is their anger going to go? They're going to, their anger is going to go against these people because that next level up the donor class the capitalist class, actual mm. bosses, mm. from Warren Buffett to Elon Musk to um, 
um, you know, shadow more shadowy figures, the heads of VCs, whose names I don't know either, they're so protected by layers of mediation. Mm. We are a mediating class, and we mediate the will of the capitalists with regard to the working class. So we have to articulate that position mm -hmm. more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There are people like um, who are on the right. You know who retweeted me is Mark Andreessen, who was one of the founders of Netscape, who's mm -hmm. like one of these big, you know, lords of the universe. And he's, you know, also, um, you know, on this like PMC, anti-PMC um, um, bandwagon. But the thing is like, I'll listen to what he has to say, but the the horizon for what I want is not free markets. It's really a redistributive socialist utopia, right? Mm. So we'll we'll have differences. We can be very clear about our differences. I can be very, very clear. I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of these guys. And mm -hmm. I can debate any of them. And if they're honest with me, I will have an honest debate. I feel like right now in the, in the sort of libertine left that you're talking about, they're not, they don't want to have an honest debate with me. You know, they want to dismiss me as whatever, Normie, Nazbol, whatever. I don't, I'm not going to call anyone names. I'm just going to debate you until you're blue in the face. And it's not necessarily a friendly debate. It may not come to a kind of harmonization, but there has to be a clarity of positions. And I feel like liberals have given up on working class discontent and they don't speak to it. Look at Nancy Pelosi. I mean, my God, what a what a um, what a complete political um, uh, puppet of capitalism she is. Right? It, we only can have that reaction because we have leaders like Pelosi on the liberal side. So the important thing is for us to differentiate ourselves from the Democratic Party, from the politics they represent, and to create more powerful. Um, visions of the future and um, mm -hmm. actual economic, cultural, and class solidarity. Um, why do you, yeah, amen. I mean, I agree with, that's really great. Why, why do you think, Catherine, there's so much aversion to the prospect of creating an independent workers party in this country? Yeah, like, you know, know, know. Yeah, that's oh, a great question. How do you feel, to me, this is like the, the third lesson. party. Yeah, yeah, this is like the, <laughs> The big thing, you know, um, something we're that we're in a duopoly, you know, we're yeah. in a duopoly. It's it's called um, monopoly capitalism. And they monopoly, you know, the two parties monopolize that political space. So what do you do beyond that? What do you do to try to create that third party um, position right now? And I think everyone is answer asking that question. Are, uh, wait, 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 wait. Are, are they? I see Jacobin magazine. The leadership, I see the Brooklyn socialists still tied to the AOC Democratic Party prospect. Mm. I think that there's, I think that there is a complex PMC unconscious allegiance to mm. the paternalism of the DNC that mm. absolutely goes on there. Well, um, I was just on Revolutionary Blackout Network, and they are asking this question: like, let's try, let you know, divorce. We have to divorce the Democratic Party. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. Like after this year, after the last Bernie defeat, I'm like, I, I'm exiting this abusive relationship. You know, I'm stop I don't want to be in a position where part where the left flank we're asking for recognition. I'm done. we we should all be done with that. We should not be angry, like trying to convince them. We should be trying to create a new political formation. So um, I think within the Jacobin crew, there are differing positions. And I do think that um, there is an unconscious, as you say, centrifugal force even to just aligning yourself with what the democratic line wants to be. I mean, even like the dirtbag left is, you know, towing the line right now. And, um, you know, you, we have to be willing to take positions that are really unpopular with the democratic elites. So, and, you know, I did on Jacobin when we were talking about California because Chapo were like, oh yeah, Chesa Boudin, um, he's, you know, he's good. We should not, we should not recall him in San Francisco. And I was like, you know what? California is really fucked up place. We, we're all democratic. It's all democratic on the top down. People, it's not just elites in San Francisco unhappy with Chesa Boudin and justice reform. 
working class people trapped in San Francisco, having to walk the streets of San Francisco, afraid to walk the streets of San Francisco, they are part of that alliance that recalled him. Mm. It's an interesting alliance of mm. different elements that you cannot just dismiss as, you know, PMC reactionaries or something. There was there is a real working class fear on mm. the streets of San Francisco now. Like um are Asian Asian Americans who live in San Francisco who are endangered, they are working class people. Like all the rich working all the rich Asian immigrants moved to San Jose, you know, or mm. they're in the sub suburbs. Mm. Who's walking the streets? Who's shopping at the Walgreens? Who's um having to confront the degeneration of social safety in that city, public safety in that city. It's actually um, working class people of all races, actually. So I thought that was a really interesting configuration there of the recall. And we have to be able to take stances that say, you know what, maybe he did go too far. Maybe the DNC doesn't like us to say this, but maybe we should look at what working class interests are with regard to public safety. So we we have to be able to dissent from those lines of thought. And, you know, the UC system, I have to say, mm -hmm. is like a branch of the Democratic Party. Mm. It really is. Mm. Mm. And we are, you know, we align ourselves with the California Democratic Party yeah. in in so many ways. And when the centrist Republicans come in, they're center, they're centrist. But um, how do we create a third party sensibility? It's very hard, but I don't think it's, it's impossible. We have to start. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting what's going to happen with the imposition of austerity policies because it's going to imply that a lot of people who may have commitments to some of the ideas we're talking about, broad universal policies, socialistic policies, will be in a position mm -hmm. to enforce discipline on working class people, people under them, manage them, and that's going to create a profound um, ill at ease and a kind of aggressiveness aggressiveness mm. and the culture of professional classes does permeate an aggressivity it's pretty profound and lash writes all about that in culture because that's one of the um affects of the culture of narcissism is a kind of unhinged aggressivity mm -hmm. um well he says at some point that we're permeated with rage and we no longer know how to desire and this was in 79 you know i and interviewed so i interviewed um i interviewed his um his daughter, who's an American historian, on my mm -hmm. on my program. If you should check it out, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard her speak. Mm -hmm. um, it you know um, the recession is here already. What we just received, we just received news that we're going to have to take three percent cuts in the core of our budgets mm. at UCI. Mm. It's here. And those budget cuts are coming and there's going to be layoffs. Mm. Um, in 2008, after 2008 financial crisis, we actually all had to take furloughs. We had to take like 10% pay cuts. So it'd be interesting to see if there, it's going to go that far this time. Mm. But it's, it's scary for every single level of um, the PMC and the working class below it. But what happens when there's like economic fear is more intellectual conformity hmm. because hmm. everyone's worried about their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, don't, but don't you think also that like the, I wanted to, maybe this would be our final question because I've kept you for a long time. Um, yeah. It seems to me like the, the ideology coherence of the professional classes, if we could even say that it has a coherence or that it has a center. Right. Seems, right. To, me, it seems to me like it doesn't have a center. seems to me like mm. it's like, um, set off adrift and that maybe it's, it's, in a, it's in a new stage of crisis and an emergency and such that it's hungry for something new to latch onto because it actually doesn't have a home base to ideologically cohere itself. I've thought a lot about that and I was wondering if you agree with that and I'm wondering- No, I totally if, agree. I totally I wonder agree. If, I you, think... if you have a sense of like what might be coming next, like what might be some of the kind of, you know, new ways because they, they don't you think maybe as a class formation and you could call it bourgeois ideology that's what marxists would call it um that it requires a coherence like this is why i'm writing a book right now about nietzsche and that was actually nietzsche's function it's a beautiful function which is not beautiful but beautiful in a subversive way which is that he gave a critique of capitalism which allowed everything to remain the status quo hmm? mm -hmm. 
And that's actually what, in conditions of crisis, bourgeois ideology must find, right? It must find a critique of itself that's not going to be total critique, but enough mm. to sort of, you know, satiate and kind of just keep the thing going. I'm just curious, like, what new directions do you see the well, ideological... we've seen it. We've seen it already. It's going to be anti-China, anti-Putin. They're going to stand on the um, um, basis of anti-totalitarianism and use that kind of position to promulgate American imperialism abroad. And it's going to. We're already seeing this in the sort of um, the use of Ukraine as a place for testing American weapons. The military, the security state is going to up its ante. We see already a consensus, like all those Ukrainian flags on social media. There's a liberal consensus that we need to send this nation to war in perpetuum so that we can keep giving them arms. Um, that's there is a crisis of legitimacy within liberalism itself, and it's the justification for it will be a kind of covert security state disguised as. Um, anti-totalitarianism mm. and um, a prolongation of for, forever wars and mm. um, I don't know if that's new. I, mm. I don't. I don't think it's new. It's very old, actually. They're bringing up all of these um, terrifying images of both um, the, so the former Soviet Union conflated with Putin and, of course, communist China. You know, in the um, in, in the space of, in the um, presentation of China, mm. and so. Um, I do think that the U.S. Imperial, Imperium is really um, grow, going, um, it, it is in decline. And so we're going to see a kind of declining um, U.S. power. And one way that the left, if it could renounce the security state, foreign adventurism, and reinvest in a kind of economic nationalism, could you know reject that kind of imperial adventure that mm -hmm. might be a way of breaking with the liberal consensus that we need to be involved in these forever wars. I mean, I just started reading um, about Yugoslavia, because the breakup of Yugoslavia mm -hmm. with this whole Ukraine thing. And that is just like one of the most terrifying things that ever happened. NATO's incursions into that country and then NATO's expansion now with Ukraine. So I, I there's that... Um, adventurism abroad that's going to create this kind of liberal consensus around a kind of, around militarism in the security state. And um, I'm concerned about that. But at the same time, we have to be insistent upon the class question. Why do we not want to be at war forever? Because we need to reinvest in infrastructure. We need to invest in the American economy. We didn't reinvest in American working class. And mm. so that that critique has to be constantly like foregrounded. Mm -hmm. But I don't, you know, I, it, there's definitely a crisis of legitimacy right now. Yeah. So we can agree on that. And then we can think about how we get out of, how we, you know, undermine the PMC yeah. hold well, on it, politics. That yeah. might be our, the next it's strategy. Tricky. It's tricky. I mean, there's always a kind of latency period with these things. Like, Tea Party, then Occupy Wall Street came mm. after mm. 08. And I think there's a kind of psychoanalytic historical reading you could make on the shock that we're experiencing. There will be, <laughs> Lord, Lord, pray that there will be a worker pushback in the form uh, of we don't know what it will take. Right. That's we right. don't know what it That's will take, right. but it's at that moment. You know, you could even say bad Jews theory of the event could be helpful in navigating something like that. But I think no, um, but OK, <laughs> well, that's another conversation for us to have. No, uh, no, I don't want to have this conversation. It's not interesting. That's fine. I, that's just fine. Disagree. That's fine. I just disagree. I just disagree. OK, about these okay. notion of the event can help us here. Um, you know, history is made through class struggle and um, the PMC wants to be the maker of history. But there could be uh, an overthrow of the liberal um, domination of politics, and it may come from the right. January 6th was an example of right. a right-wing right. um, attempt at armed insurrection. And um, the way that things are going now, unless the left really mobilizes that kind of anger and popular anger, then we probably will see more right-wing um, insurrection. There's a 
fraying of the social fabric with regard to um, gun violence. There's already an undeclared sense of civil war in our country. And um, we and uh, we should be alert to this and not ignore it. And I really do think that without a fully articulated, powerful left commitment to redistribution and to class politics, um, we will see a terrifying um, result of right wing opportunism. Mm -hmm. And we know that liberalism always likes fascism better than it likes socialism. So that's what we have to be prepared for. We're not at fascism yet, but we could get there. And um, I'm not sure that the event helps us understand that. I Look, really that, want that to ground a, us in kind of political side, it was categories. Side point. It, was, it was a way of, side point. Yeah. It was, it's not a way of like um, a compass to the future. It's a way of analyzing uh, the past. I think Bedju actually has a lot, teaches us about modes of, of looking at revolutionary history. He kind mm -hmm. of, periodizes Marxist revolutionary history in very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. He picks up he picks up on the Soviet project of actually saying that um, one of the beautiful things that Bajou actually does, I've been in this debate with a lot of left Nietzscheans lately, just as a side point which connects, that he develops, tries to develop a pretty comprehensive theory of a Marxist theory of egalitarianism and of equality, which mm -hmm. you know Marx was against egalitarianism on paper. He said it was a French idea and that there's no egalitarianism within bourgeois capitalism. So mm -hmm. he didn't really develop a theory of equality. But in our age, in a unipolar post-communist age, I think it's so foolish for Marxists. One good thing about Marxists like Badiou, he's developed a theory of communist justice and a theory of equality, which I think are quite robust, okay? And um, so I don't want to just say like, oh, event, okay. it's too fetishistic, okay. we can just... Okay. No, 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 he still has a lot to offer. Uh, intellectual Marxists, I think. And keep in mind also, a lot of these things on intellectuality and theory would be a lot different because I'm a student of the history of American Trotskyism. Um, it would be a lot different if we did have a workers' party because theory then takes on a different material connectivity. Yep. Huh? Yep. Huh? Yep. And, you know, the seriousness of theory then actually has stakes, right? Yep. So anyways, anyways, Catherine. Yeah, we can leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. Thanks for coming on. Thank this you very, for uh, having thanks me. Thanks for all the comments. Thanks everybody for. Yeah, sorry, sorry we couldn't. I, I couldn't. We couldn't. Res I was trying to respond to some of the comments, but. It was great, Catherine. We'll have to have you back on. Thanks. Really enjoyed thanks it. Thanks so much. Thanks all everybody. Right. Have Take a great care. night. Bye. Take care. Bye.